There we go. Well, welcome, welcome everyone online. Thank you for being here this evening. seeing us all safely here this evening. Pray that you'll be with us this evening as we sing praises to you and worship you. Hear a word from your book. Pray that you'll be with the speaker this evening. Help guide the words to be your words. Help open our hearts and minds to the lessons you have for us, dear Lord. Guide us from here out into the world. Help us to carry you with us always. Keep us safe in your hands. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, is there anyone that didn't get communion this morning? Matthew. Well, let's turn over to number 289. We'll sing the first verse of this. We have a few words before Matthew has communion. Number 289. We'll just sing the first verse here. the individuals, but we didn't get to break the loaf anymore. 
And that was just part of the symbolism of breaking the loaf and breaking his body. Yeah. There was still some that would take the little tree yeah. ones and break it in the plate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was many that did, yeah, did yeah. just that. Our yeah. church had one of the big crackers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was real. Yeah. Yeah. Always took the cracker and broke. That was just one of the symbolisms that we used to do a lot. It's just one of the things to remember as we keep God always in our hearts and minds. We'll have a word of prayer just a moment here for the communion. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your son that you did send down to die for us. We thank you for this chance to remember you in the taking of this communion. Pray that you'll bless our hearts and minds and keep us always focused on your son. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn over to number 501. Give me the Bible. One of the ones I seem to lead a lot because I seem to like it a lot. Well, let's sing the first, second, and last verses of this one. 501. Number 501.
Well, tonight we are going to be in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 8. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day we've had. We thank you for the fellowship and the reading of your word, being able to worship you and learn again from you. Lord, we just ask that tonight you will speak to us once again and help us to learn about some of the things that we've learned in the past and forgot, or perhaps there are new things that we haven't learned before, but just speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and put everything underneath his feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, <clears throat> You will not properly know yourself until you begin with 
God. Psalm 8, it uh, first of all reflects on God and his, his greatness and his glory, and then on man and the glory and honor of man. But the glory and honor of man, you know, is tied to the glory and the honor of God. So the book ends of Psalm uh, 8 is in verse 1 and verse 9, and they're, they're the same. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so he begins and he ends with that, but then sandwiched in the middle there, he speaks about the glory of man. Now the Greeks taught uh, a philosophy which went, know thyself. Uh, but biblical wisdom is exactly the opposite. <coughs> biblical wisdom says, fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so that is how we come to know God, having this proper view uh, of God, having this honor and respect, this wonder for who God is, and then we can start to think about ourselves. So David begins with God. So in verse 1, when David says, O Lord, our Lord, this is not a repetition. It seems like it at first glance. But the first Lord, if you notice, is in all caps which means that this is the name Yahweh. So Yahweh means the, the self-existent one, uh, the I am, who always was, is, and forever shall be. Uh, and uh, this is the name that, that God used, you remember, when he called Moses from the, the burning bush. And the second Lord is in lowercase, so it, it just means Lord, it means a master. So David says, O oh, Yahweh, the great I am, the self-existent one, my master. And uh, David, he, he's delighting in the fact that, you know, God has revealed himself by his name. Because he's not just a God or a God that created the, the heavens and the earth. But, you know, God revealed his personal name, Yahweh. And as We've been studying through the Old Testament, you know, this Yahweh, um, there's, there's words that are added to it, like Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide. And uh, so, but this is the beginning of his, of his revealed name when he spoke to Moses uh, from the bush. So, um, and David is picking up on that, this revealed name of God, because it reveals his character, that he's a personal God, that he's a covenant God, that he's, he's making this uh, covenant with, with his people, Israel. O oh, Yahweh, my master, how majestic is your name. And majestic is a word of comparison, so it, can, it, it compares, you know, that which is inferior to it. So a, a, another way you could say it is, how superior is your name in all the earth? Um, it doesn't sound as good as how majestic, but how majestic. And what David is saying is that, you know, this, magnific this magnificence of God, you know, is displayed in the works of God on the earth. And so David's looking at nature, you know, he's, he's looking at creation, and he's, he's saying to us, and to himself, you know, open up your eyes and, and see the magnificence of God because it's all around you. There's this chorus that goes, uh, majesty, worship his majesty. You guys know that one? Yeah. <laughs> oh, in New Zealand? Yeah, well, uh, the guy that wrote it, his name is Jack Hayford. And he wrote it after he visited a palace in England. And he thought, you know, what would it be like to be brought up, you know, in a palace like this, filled with all this majesty? And then he began to think about the majesty of God. And so out of that came this song, Majesty, um, to kind of emphasize it, emphasizing the worshiping of God's majesty, his, his magnificence. 
his magnificence, his, his splendor. Uh, Elizabeth Browning, she was a poet, and she wrote, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who takes off his shoes, the rest sit around unaware. And uh, that speaks to us because, you know, as Christians, we see things the rest of the world just doesn't see. Until they have the Spirit of God in them, and then suddenly the blinders come off, you know, and we're able to, to see those kinds of things. So David wants to do that. David wants to take the blinders off of, off of us and just um, to see God's majesty, to see his, his glory and all of this uh, creation. For, through every creature and every every plant uh, on the earth, and then the stars in the sky, all of this, you know, should fill us with wonder. Well, in verses three and four, he says, "When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him?" And, you know, all through history, people have gazed at the heavens. In recent times, you know, we've, be, we've begun to explore them. Uh, when the first astronauts, when they uh, went to the moon, they didn't land on it the first time. They just revolved around uh, the, the moon. And when they came over to the other side and they saw the, the earth for the first time, they quoted uh, Genesis chapter 1. And anybody that was tuned in... Uh, heard the scriptures um, and uh, they were just transformed by that because just being out in space and seeing you know all of that um, it was just a testimony to them about the glory of God and they wanted to share that with everybody else and then when they came back uh, they were you know they, they believed in God all the more because they saw you know his order and his beauty uh, from out in space and, you know, all of us have been, um, maybe some of you many times, maybe some of you a few times, but have gone out of town, been in a remote place, you know, where there weren't any lights, and the sky is really black, there aren't any clouds in the sky, and just how bright those stars are, you know, and just how amazing that that can be. And I, I think that David was, was like that, you know, um, just looking up at all the stars, and and uh, he had no idea how many stars there were up there. Um, for him, you know, just seeing with the naked eye, he could see some, but uh, we know that there's billions and billions of them out there. And whenever, you know, we're in a place like that, if we're camping or something, we just think, you know, how cool is that when we stop to take time to sit down and reflect on it, you know, uh, we can still be blown away by that and just the, the wonder of it all. And so David was doing this and he was just thinking, you know, that I serve an awesome God. And, but when he looked at heavens, he also had some questions, you know, and uh, God gave us minds to think. And so, he says, when I consider your heavens, which really means the universe, what is man that you are mindful of him? And it says that we were made a little lower than the heavenly beings. And uh, being a little bit lower than the heavenly beings, well, that's better than uh, coming from monkeys. Yep. Right? Uh, <laughs> Now, the, the heavenly beings, they live in the, the heavenly realms. God and the angels, that's where they dwell. And uh, we don't understand a lot about the spiritual realms, the spiritual forces that are out there, but we know that they exist. And, um, but we can grasp some things, some of the things that the scripture re, scriptures reveal to us. Um, but we do know about human beings, and we know about this earth that we live on, but we learn from this this uh, psalm here that our role is kind of similar to the role of the angels in heaven. Now, in Hebrews first chapter, verse fourteen, it tells us that the angels are ministering spirits who serve 
in those dimensions. That's what they're doing. They're constantly serving the Almighty, running errands for him, doing his bidding, uh, bringing messages to Mary or whoever it may be, Daniel. Uh, they also, you know, um, are sent to display power. Um, one angel in the book of uh, Kings killed 185,000 soldiers during the night. So God gives them, you know, great power to do things. But they're, they're servants of God. And we also are servants, but we're servants down here on earth. So we are also servants of God, but we're made a little bit lower than the angels. But only man is made in the image of God. The angels are made in the image of God. Um, and uh, as far as we know, angels can't be forgiven. You know, once they, once they fall, they fall. Uh, but we have this uh, grace that is extended to us um, that uh, God will redeem us. But we're made a little lower than the angels, and we have this special privilege because the psalm says that we're crowned with glory and honor. You know, God, we are the crown of God's creation. You know, when we read through Genesis, he made all these things, and but the crown of achievement of what God made here on earth was, was man. So he's, he's chosen to have this fellowship with, with us and with no one else. <clears throat> Another psalm says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, God talks about how he knit us together in the womb, and he's caring about us and thinking about us every day of our lives. So, you know, we've been made by God. We have this relationship with God, and we're servants of God. But what about this verse? He's put all things under our feet. Now, we have done some great things. You know, uh, we've been able to achieve a lot of things. We've built airplanes that fly across the ocean. We've, we've built cars and, and bridges and dams and cities and ships and all kinds of things. Um, we've explored the depths of the earth, you know, finding gems and uh, all kinds of, of things that we need, like oil and coal and things like that. Um, we've invented computers. And uh, contact lenses. I wouldn't be able to see it right now, but I have contact lenses on. <laughs> We've come up with cures for all kinds of diseases, you know? And uh, we were able to have transplants. I mean, who would ever thought that we could do something like that? Uh, God gave us the ability to create music and create all kinds of art. You know, there's a lot of things that we're still able to do, even in our fallen state. But the thing is, we don't rule over everything. Um, and everything is not underneath our feet. So what is David talking about here? Well, we get more insight into this if we go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. So if you want to go to Hebrews chapter 2, because... The writer in Hebrews, he quotes this psalm, and he talks about it in more depth. So in chapter 2, in verse 5, um, he says, it, Is it not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking? So angels are not going to rule the world to come. Uh, but he's, he's going to use man to rule the world to come. And the angels are actually going to serve us when we get to heaven. So God has redeemed us. And so we are going to become rulers in the next life. So God's, this was God's original intention for humanity. And this is what David's writing about in the middle of Psalm 8. This is what God had intended for man, for all things to be underneath his feet. Verses 6 through 8 of Hebrews chapter 2 says, There's a place where someone has testified, and he's talking about Psalm 8 here, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor and put everything underneath his feet. Um, so when we, we look at this universe, you know, this writer is 
getting on the same topic here that David has been thinking about. You know, what is man? And that fact that we have been made, created a little bit lower than the angels. And that you have made him ruler over the works of your hand, put everything underneath his feet. God made us to rule, but we don't really see that in our fallen state. Because something happened. Sin came into the picture, remember? And I think both David and the writer of Hebrews here, they have Genesis chapter 1 in mind. You know, when David is thinking about this, he's thinking back to Genesis chapter 1. And thinking about what God's intention was for man in the beginning. So when God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, he said, let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all of the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and increase in number, Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over everything that moves along the ground. So that originally was the plan. And Adam did rule over the animals. And remember, he named them all. And uh, so the original intention was going to be this amazing thing, that everything was going to be in subjection to us, even all the plants. So like, if Adam and Eve had sinned, when you garden your garden, you know, it would just come up perfect every time. You wouldn't have to pull weeds, the bugs wouldn't eat you, all your vegetables, uh, you know, and that's what God had in mind, you know, that we would rule over everything. Um, but because of sin, all that's changed. And David is, you can still see a hint of that, you know, because there are some things that we still rule over as man, and we can't tame a lot of the, the animals um, and things like that, but everything is not subject to us. So, now when it says we're lower than the angels, it's not because um, we're not as important or anything like that. It's because of we're in this physical realm and they're in the, the spiritual realms. And so for now, you know, we're, we're bound to this earth, uh, we are lower than the angels. We have a, a lower rank. But God has a destiny for us that is beyond that. Where the scriptures will say that when we get to our destiny, like I said, that the angels will serve us. But man is confined to this earth, and the angels, they're not confined to this earth. They visit the earth sometimes, but they live in the spiritual realms. And they have great power. You know, when we study the book of Daniel, Remember the angel that came and fought with uh, Michael, the, the demonic angel, and then he made it finally. And so, I mean, there's, they're doing all kinds of things, and we can't understand it. But they have this supernatural power and strength that even Adam and Eve didn't have, you know, before uh, they sinned. But <clears throat> angels, they have this, they have this ability to, we think about it, to stand in the presence of God, and they don't die. They can take in the full glory of God, you know, uh, because they have their beings that were created to be in the presence of God. Um, and if man, you know, were to look at God, he would die just like God told Moses when he, when he asked if he could see his glory. But in the coming new heavens and earth, we know that we will be in the presence of God. We will be able to see him in his full glory. We'll be able to fellowship with him and the angels and everyone else. So things are going to be much different. So redeemed man looks a lot different than man now. And uh, he's going to inherit many things. And uh, we talked a little bit about that this morning as well. But um, the Revelation says we're going to sit with Christ on his throne and we're going to rule with him. So while we're, we're, we're here, we're a little bit more than the angels, um, but the whole earth, you know, is one day going to be redeemed, those that are in Christ, and things will be different. Now, in verse 7 of chapter 2, or if you're in uh, Psalm, it's chapter 5 of Psalm, but both writers, they point out that God has crowned man, that he, he created him with all this glory and power. You know, when God made Adam, he made him innocent. 
He gave him honor and he gave him glory. And he's going to restore it, just like it was before. So Adam and, and Eve, they had the, they were the crown of the creation. They were kind of like this king and queen of all of God's creation. They had this glorious paradise, and God it even says God walked with them in the cool of the day, you know. So all this amazing authority that man had in the beginning. And like I said, God did put everything underneath his feet. God gave man to rule over, just like he said that I read there from Genesis chapter 1. Um, so the original intention of God, you know, is just beyond words. And it's hard for us to, to get our minds around it because we've fallen so far. But, um, but just think about it, that we're going to have that same honor and glory again. And we're going to be given this, this privilege to, to rule over the new earth. God's creating a new earth. And we don't know what all that means, but somehow we're going to live on this new earth and rule over it in some capacity. But uh, we're made in God's image, and he cares He cares for each one of us. Um, but like I said, you know, uh, sin came into the picture, so we were put out of the garden. And also the earth itself was corrupted. And so all of mankind fell. We lost our crown, so to speak. And uh, now we see, we don't see the earth subject to man. Uh, so there's a lot of things that happened with the curse. You know, there were storms and thistles. And that was part of man's curse that we have to live with. So... You know, even with all our modern technology, we still have to fight against these things. I mean, it, modern technology makes it somewhat better, but it is still a struggle. It's, still a struggle. <laughs> it's a struggle. I mean, even when I get that out there with my lawnmower, it's still a struggle to mow my lawn. <laughs> I don't know how they mowed their lawn in the old days, but <laughs> even with a lawnmower, it's tough. But, um, not only that, but the animal kingdom, you know, not all the animals are subject to man. Um, some of them, uh, out of fear, you know, respect man, uh, but some of them don't. Some of them eat man and things like that. So, um, but there's all these things that have kind of been reversed because of, of the curse. And um, <clears throat> we have extreme weather, like Extreme hot, extreme cold. You know, the original earth was not like that. So the weather is not in subject to man. Um, there's poisonous plants out there now. Adam and Eve didn't have to deal with poisonous plants. And then all the, the natural disasters like earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, diseases. All of that stuff was not there before the fall. So basically everything that God had given man in the beginning was a blessing, but because of sin and the curse, there's been this losing battle ever since, that it's not subject to anymore. And we also have found out uh, through the Apostle Paul, even if we could have figured it out through those things, but Paul uh, in the book of Romans chapter 8, he talks about how creation itself, the earth, is in decay just like we are because of the curse. Uh, chapter 8, verse 19, he says that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by his own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. So God subjected uh, the earth to this curse, uh, and that man would continually have this trouble. And God is planning to reverse that curse as well. But uh, when the new earth begins, uh, Romans 8 goes on to say, in hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and be brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up into this present time. So the earth... It, uh, itself is aware of this curse that came with the fall and it's groaning it's groaning to have redemption just like we are groaning in our bodies to have redemption amen 
Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, man, you know, is subject to the earth. So we plant things, but we're not sure that we'll reap things, right? Um, especially in the old days, the farmers, you know, sometimes if the hail came, they wiped out their entire crops, you know, and they starved to death. Um, we build cities and houses and things like that, but they're vulnerable, aren't they? We have fires, we have storms. If you live where I grew up in the Midwest, there's tornadoes that wipe out cities. Um, if you live on the coast, there's hurricanes that destroy your home. All these things that we're, we're vulnerable to those things. And uh, so we never know, and we never know about our bodies, you know. One day we might wake up and have a tumor or get cancer, or we could have an accident or something terrible might happen, you know. Um, and medicines and doctors and hospitals and pesticides and insurance companies and, and uh, police departments and funeral homes, all these have been established because of the curse. We wouldn't have any of those things, you know, if we, the earth was not cursed. So no wonder the, the creation groans, but God didn't intend for it to be this way. So that's why it's only for a little while. You know, it's just during God's time timetable here. But someday, uh, the hospitals are going to close their doors forever. Won't that be amazing? <laughs> and the doctors are going to go out of business. <laughs> and uh, uh, the animals and the human beings, they're all going to be changed. And um, we're all going to be re redeemed, and we're going to reign. It's a wonderful God, a plan that God has for us, you know, this dominion that man has lost, but he will recover again because of what Jesus did, only because of what Jesus did. Um, so verse 9, the writer of Hebrews brings in Jesus to show that Jesus is the one that reversed all this. He says, but we see Jesus, who is also made a little lower than the angels, but now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So by Jesus coming down here and being a man, and taking our sins upon himself and going through everything that we go through as a man, he reversed the curse for us. So he's going to recover all of that. And uh, so by the cross, you know, all this has been, has been removed. He paid the penalty, he removed the curse. And uh, And also, uh, Jesus is now, you know, he's, he's been raised, and he is now crowned with glory and honor. And he, everything is put under, sub, under sub, subject and underneath his feet. In fact, the scripture says, everyone will bow to him. But he first humbled himself, you know, came down here, was obedient, went to the cross for us, humbled himself to the point of death, and now he is exalted. Now he's sitting at, at God's right hand and everything is put underneath his feet. So all of creation was subject to Jesus. Even when Jesus was on the earth, uh, you saw creation was subjected to him, right? Um, when he wanted to stop the storm, he just said, be quiet. I don't think we'll be able to do those kind of things, but... <laughs> but <laughs> But everything was subject to him, right? Diseases. If you, if you came across a person with a disease, he cast it out. He was over the diseases. He was over any kind of situation, demonic spirits. You know, he cast them out. He was over them. Um, but in a, in a similar way, you know, because we are under Christ, and because Christ gives us his authority, he's going to give us privileges to have dominion over the earth. Not quite the extent that Jesus has, but when you see that power and that dominion that Christ had over, over the earth. Um, but because of that, 
You know, we are going to reign on this earth one day. Or not this earth, but the new one that he's created. But even now, Scripture talks about that we are reigning spiritually with Jesus Christ. Ephesians says, God raised us up with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Isn't that an amazing verse? That even now, we are raised up with Christ, and we are sitting with him spiritually in the heavenly realms. And then he goes on to say, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So, spiritually, we're, it's already happened because Jesus has already gone to the cross. He's already raised from the dead. He's already sitting at the Father's right hand. And he's already made us the promise that we are going to reign with him. And spiritually, that's true. So, Scripture talks about how the fact that because we're in Jesus Christ, he's redeemed us, he's, he, he, we are united with him, we share in his glory and dominion, we share in his reign, and our bodies, you know, they're going to die someday, but we're going to get resurrected bodies, they're going to be eternal, they'll be free, we can uh, reign with him forever in glory. And you know, we're just these small specks in this huge universe. You think about if David could see all that we could see with Hubble telescopes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it just goes on. There's not an end to this universe. It just keeps going and going and going. And maybe <laughs> we're never going to get to the I don't think we could ever get to the end of it because God is just so awesome. But we're his children, and we are... The objects of his affection. He cares for each one of us. And this was part of David's intent too. Just to show how great God was. And just to remind you too. Of what God, God's original intent for you. As his creation was. It wasn't supposed to be like this. In this fallen state. You weren't supposed to have all these diseases. And all these troubles of this world. God made it to be a very wonderful thing, and he's going to bring you back to that place. And I think that is partly what David's trying to get at, too, you know, that God really cares for us, and he is so awesome. But right now, we don't see everything underneath our feet, but one day we will. And it's going to be, it's going to be a wonderful place, and it's going to be a wonderful time. And we just have to remember to hold on to those promises. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your scriptures. I thank you for David. I thank you for his passion that comes out in the Psalms, his heart that he has for you, just seeing your majesty and your glory and just looking at the creation around him and just realizing the impact of that, that he's just so moved by all that he witnesses as far as just how awesome you are, how great you are. Help us never forget that. Also, help us to remember that the reason we're in the mess we're in is because of our sin and that that you didn't intend for it to be this way and you are going to restore it and we look forward to that day when everything will be subject underneath our feet because that's the way you you've made us to be the crown of your creation and so we rejoice in the day when that will happen again when we will live in the new heavens and the new earth and uh, we'll reign on that earth, and we'll be able to enjoy all your blessings, and we won't have to deal with sin and the devil and, and the curse on this earth. Lord, we just thank you for those promises that you've made, and that, uh, that because of what Jesus has done, that those things have been established. And thank you so much for Jesus willing to pay that price for us so that we could be redeemed. And uh, help us to not be discouraged Things are going to get worse in this world, but you're going to create a new one. And um, we have something better to look forward to. So help us to put our, our hope in you and our trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name.